bringing in seeds, and our pile became an oasis of life. Whereas the other three piles were dead, dark, and stinky, and the PAHs, the aromatic hydrocarbons, went from 10,000 parts per million to less than 200 in eight weeks. The last image the, we don't have, the entire pile was a green berm of life. These are gateway species, vanguard species, that open the door for, biological, uh, for other biological communities. So I invented burlap sacks, bunker spawn, and putting the mycelium using storm-blown debris, you can take these burlap sacks and put them downstream from a farm that's producing E. coli or other waste, or a factory with chemical toxins, and it leads to habitat restoration. So we set up a site in Mason County, Washington, and we've seen a dramatic decrease in the amount of coliforms. And I'll show you a graph here. This is a logarithmic scale, 10 to the 8th power. There's more than 100 million colonies per gram. And 10 to the 3rd power is around 1,000. In 48 hours to 72 hours, three, these, three, these three mushroom species reduced the amount of coliform bacteria 10,000 times. Think of the implications. This is a space conservative method that uses storm to breeze, and we can be guaranteed that we'll have storms every year. So this one mushroom in particular, Drew has drawn our interest over time, this is my wife Dusty, with a mushroom called Fomitopsis officinalis, agaricon. It's a mushroom exclusive to the old growth forest that Dioscorides first described in 65 AD as a treatment against consumption. This mushroom grows in Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, British Columbia, now thought to be extinct in Europe. It may not seem that large, Let's get closer. This is an extremely rare fungus. Our team, and we have a team of experts that go out, we went out 20 times in the old growth forest last year. We found one sample to be able to, to get into culture. Preserving the genome of these fungi in the old growth forest I think is absolutely critical for human health. I've been involved with the US Defense Department BioShield program. We submitted over 300 samples of mushrooms that we boiled in hot water and mycelium, harvesting these extracellular metabolites. And f a few years ago, we received these results. We have three different strains of agaricon mushrooms that were highly active against pox viruses. Dr. Earl Kern, who's a smallpox expert of the U.S. Defense Department, states that any compounds that have a selectivity index of two or more are active, 10 or greater are considered to be very active. Our mushroom strains were in the highly active range. There's a vetted press release that you can read that's vetted by DOD if you uh, Google uh, stamets and smallpox, or you can go to npr.org and listen to a live interview. So encouraged by this, naturally we went to flu viruses. And so for the first time I'm showing this, we have three different strains of agaricon mushrooms, highly active against flu viruses. Here's the selectivity index numbers. Against pox, you saw 10s and 20s. Now against flu viruses, compared to the ribavirin controls, we are having extraordinarily high activity. And we're using a natural extract within the same dosage window as a pure pharmaceutical. We tried against flu A viruses, H1N1, H3N2, as well as flu B viruses. So then we tried a blend. And then a blend combination, we tried it against H5N1, and we got greater than 1,000 selectivity index. I then, I then think that we can make the argument that we should save the old growth forest as a matter of national defense. I became interested in entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that kill insects. Our house is being destroyed by carpenter ants. So I went to the EPA homepage, and they were recommending studies with metarhizium species of a group of fungi that kill carpenter ants, as well as termites. I did something that nobody else had done. I actually chased the mycelium when it start, stopped producing spores. These are spores. This is no spores. I was able to morph the culture into a non-sporulating form. And so the industry has spent over $100 million specifically on, on bait stations to prevent termites from eating your house. But the insects aren't stupid, they would avoid the spores when they came close. And so I morphed the cultures into a non sporulating form. And I got my daughter's Barbie doll dish. I put it right, right with a bunch of carpenter ants for making debris fields every day in my house. And the ants were attracted to the mycelium because there's no spores. They gave it to the queen. One week later, I had no sawdust piles whatsoever. And then a delicate dance between uh, uh, dinner and death. The mycelium is consumed by the ants. They become mummified, and boing, a mushroom pops out of their head. 
Now, after sporulation, the spores repel, so the house is no longer suitable for invasion. So you have a near permanent solution for reinvasion of termites. And so my house came down, I received my first patent against carpenter ants, termites, and fire ants. Then we tried extracts, and lo and behold, we can steer insects to different directions. This has huge implications. I then received my second patent. This is a big one. It's been called an Alexander Graham Bell patent. It covers over 200,000 species. This is the most disruptive technology I've been told by executives of the pesticide industry that they have ever witnessed. This could totally revamp the pesticide industries throughout the world. You could fly 100 PhD students under the umbrella of this concept because my supposition is that antipathogenic fungi prior to sporulation attract the very insects that are otherwise repelled by those spores. And so I came up with a life box because I needed a delivery system. The life box, you could be getting a DVD of the TED conference. You had soil, you had water, you have mycorrhizal and endophytic fungi as well as spores like of the agaricon mushroom. The seeds then are mothered by, by this mycelium. And then you put tree seeds in here, and then you end up growing potentially an old growth forest from a cardboard box. I want to reinvent the delivery system and the use of cardboard around the world so they become ecological footprints. If there's a YouTube-like uh, a site that you could put up, you can make it interactive, zip code specific, where people could join together. And through satellite imaging systems, through virtual Earth or Google Earth, you could confirm carbon credits are being sequestered by the trees that are coming through life boxes. You could take a cardboard box delivering shoes. You could add water. I developed this for DARPA, for the refugee community, corns, beans, and squash, and onions. I took several containers. My wife said, if I could do this, anybody could. And I ended up growing a seed garden, and you harvested the seeds. And um, thank you, Eric Rasmussen, uh, for your help on this. And then harvesting the seed garden, then you can harvest the kernels. And then I just need a few kernels. I add mycelium to it, and then I inoculate the corn cobs. Now, three corn cobs, no, no other grain, lots of mushrooms begin to form. Too many withdrawals from the carbon bank. And so this population will be shut down, but watch what happens here. The mushrooms that are harvested, but very importantly, the mycelium has converted to cellulose and to fungal sugars. And so I thought, how could we address the energy crisis in this country? And we came up with ethanol. Generating ethanol from cellulose using mycelium as an intermediary, and you gain all the benefits that I've described to you already. But to go from cellulose to ethanol, is ecologically unintelligent, and I think that we need, need to be ecologically intelligent about the generation of fuels so we build the carbon banks on the planet, renew, renew the soils. These are a species that we need to join with. I think engaging mycelium can help save the world. Thank you very much.